The main focus of today's module is going to be uh, looking at the effects of exercise training on skeletal muscle. So we're going to look mainly at endurance training and in strength training. Right, so in the past couple lectures we started off with looking at structure and function of muscle and then kind of uh, started talking about how muscle contracts and some of the uh, properties. Right? So those are more acute, these are the long term uh, effects of training. So uh, we're talking multiple weeks, uh, two months to even years of training. So let's uh, kind of take a look at two main concepts that I want to review before we jump uh, into um, into today's content. So uh, we've talked about fiber types uh, earlier on in the semester and I know that's something that's, that's relatively um, new to you guys. So I want to review it and point out uh, kind of three of the big main points uh, that we're going to discuss uh, when we start talking about training and how they affect fiber types. The first I want to do is compare force and power output between fiber types. So in the first graph we'll look at uh, the, the graph on the far end of the screen for me, and that is a specific force of muscle. The way we define specific force is the force normalized to the area of the muscle. So uh, we can think of muscle as a circle, right, kind of a long tube. The larger the muscle, the more force it can produce. And so the way that we essentially normalize this uh, to compare smaller muscles to larger muscles, or in other words, type 1 fibers to type 2 B or X fibers is we normalize it by what's known as cross-sectional area, otherwise known as the size of the, the muscle in itself. So specific force completely uh, uh, rules out any different sizes. So if we then normalize to size, what we can see in this graph here is that force is lowest in type 1 fibers. I'll say this, you don't have to know uh, the specific values there on the y-axis, just know the, the trend or the pattern, that we have the lowest amount of force generation capacity in a type 1 fiber. If we then go to our fast twitch fibers, both 2A and 2B or X fibers, you'll see that we get higher levels of force. So type 2A higher, type 2B uh, or X the highest amount of specific force uh, capacity. Indeed, this is a relatively new concept. When I was an undergraduate, we were actually taught that specific force, no matter um, the fiber type, was um, actually the same. Now with advancing techniques, we've been able to look at individual muscle fibers much closer and really be able to tease out these benefits. And so uh, if you're ever curious as we walk through, is, is, is the field of exercise physiology ever changing? Yes, indeed it is, and this is a perfect example. So our type 2 fibers generate much more force, and what about power? Again, we can define power uh, output as amount of force generated per time in order to generate that, that force. Right? You're, you should be able to remember back uh, to earlier lectures where we talked about time to peak tension uh, in the, the fibers, and that tells us how fast we reach our maximal force output. And in those cases, you'll re you should remember that type 2 fibers reach their uh, uh, peak tension much, much faster than type 1, right? So if we then compare those two and put them in a graph form, right, so we have the amount of force that we talked about before, and then the time to peak tension that it takes. Uh, there we have high force, low uh, time required to reach that force in type 2 fibers. So you can see that the power output seen in this figure closest to me is much, much larger, right? So power output much lower in type 1, type 2A, somewhere in the middle, and type 2 BRX generate the highest power capabilities. So that's one of the properties, uh, force and power generation. The other thing that we want to look, about, look at is fatigability. So how long does it take for these fibers to get tired? I'll note, I'm going to keep it relatively simple. In lab, we're going to do uh, a little bit more deeper in depth, and I'm going to give you a couple different definitions of fatigue. But here we're just going to think about fatigue simply as looking at on this graph as you know when the uh, the amount of force starts to decline uh, from your maximal force generation right so if we'll look up in the blue graph here in the in the top corner we'll see that this is for slow oxidative fibers or our type 1 muscle fibers so our force our tension is on the the y-axis and our time is on the x-axis as we've learned these slow oxidative fibers use oxidative metabolism, hence the name, and are able to generate ATP very rapidly, or uh, generate lots and lots and lots of ATP, so that, in theory, they never really get super tired. 
And this figure essentially demonstrates that, right? So the top part of that uh, kind of bluish line uh, stays consistent among the top, right? So if we look at the x-axis, we go in minutes all the way to hours, right? So 60 minutes, we still see no decrease in force as an indicator of fatigue. Therefore, uh, you know, going back to uh, the properties of fiber types, type 1 muscle fibers are, of course, fatigue resistant. Just below that, in the orange um, category, is uh, the fast oxidative fibers or our type 2A muscle fibers. And you can see that these actually do see a degree of fatigue that tends to happen. And so you'll see uh, for several minutes they are able to maintain their force, but after about four or five minutes, right, we start to see a slow decline in the height of those orange bars, meaning they're not generating as much force as they were, uh, indicating that there is fatigue happening in these. Right? So these still function pretty well. As you can see, out to 10 minutes, we're still at about 80% or so of our uh, uh, peak force. Right? So these uh, are kind of fatigue resistant, but don't have near that property of the slow oxidative fiber. So kind of as we've discussed, being that in-between fiber. Last but not least, in our purple figure here, we have our fast glycolytic fibers. Uh, our fast glycolytic fibers, also known as type 2B or X fibers, you'll see that the height of that line indicating force falls off incredibly rapidly, right? So within about a minute and a half, uh, the, uh, uh, the force generating capacity of these fibers uh, is severely depressed, right? These fatigue incredibly fast, and therefore we say that these are fast fatigable fibers as well. Right? So what I want you to think about as then as we move in is one of the concepts that, that has become important in uh, muscle physiology and, and kind of changed uh, a lot more in the last 15, 20 years, as, as, as Dr. Trappy pointed out uh, in that previous video, is we now know that, that muscle is, is, a, is an ever-changing organ, right? We aren't just set in how we're born, that we can actually have some adaptations to those fiber types, right? So I want to highlight, again, those fiber types and introduce one new concept here in this figure. Right? So uh, when we start talking about fiber types, we can essentially compare them just as I did. Endurance or force, and force and power essentially go hand in hand, so we'll just put it in as force here. Right? So our type 1 muscle fibers, as you can kind of see here, uh, with the 6 star rating and endurance, is, is they can go on forever, but they don't generate a lot of force. Right? On the opposite end of this triangle, type 2 B or X fibers, little endurance, lots of force. Right? And so in between that, right, we have kind of this continuum of different ratings to kind of get uh, both a combination of force and endurance. The ultimate point being that, in general, as endurance rating decreases, force generating capacity goes up. And of course, vice versa is true. As force rating decreases, endurance capacity then goes up. The concept that's new to this slide that I want to introduce is the idea of these uh, kind of continuum fibers that are somewhat in between, that aren't truly uh, only a type 1, a type 2, or type 2B or X, a type 2A or type 2B or X fiber. Right? So um, as you can see here, they're denoted by the letter C uh, in the uh, uh, in the nomenclature, so we have a type 1 fiber, uh, which is again our very traditional. Then we have kind of this uh, intermediate fiber, which expresses uh, some mostly type 1, but also some type 2 uh, A fiber properties. We have type 2 C, right? Uh, we have type 2 A, type 2 A X, which is kind of again that idea of that intermediate fiber that's somewhere between an A and a B or X. Right? The idea that we aren't just in this, you know, three categories, that we can have a relatively broad continuum based on these expressing the same genes from two different fiber types. Right? And when we talk genes, of course, if you'll remember back, the key gene, of course, is the myosin ATPase. That's the one that we really look at because that's ultimately going to determine how fast cross-bridge cycling can take place. Right? So if we start to think about this from a physiology perspective and the idea of Okay, so now we know we have kind of these three distinct fiber types which have very broad properties, right? And now we know we can kind of fill in the gaps with these intermediates. The question becomes, if we can transition fibers, so if you have the ability to train in certain ways 
that you can alter the uh, phenotype of these fibers, which direction do you think they'll transition to? Do we want a whole bunch of type 1 fibers? Will we transition to type 2B or X? Or do we go somewhere in between? And if you think about it, right, the best part about this is the idea that we generally want to land somewhere in the middle. I'll jump back to this, right? But in general, we want to land probably in that type 2A uh, rating because that's a relatively high endurance rating and a relatively high force. We get the best of both worlds. And indeed, that's what happens, right? So we do get a transition from type 2X fibers to, again, those type 2AX intermediates and then to type 2A oxidative fibers, right? Um, and in general, I can say that this is the easiest switch to make between fiber types, is that we can do um, endurance training in certain, uh, um, any type of things that are gonna stress the oxidative metabolism of these fibers will ultimately cause them to transition somewhat more towards a type 2A muscle fiber. Right? So that's the first part. The type 1 fibers, uh, we do see a little bit of, um, of fiber type switching, but it's in generally thought to be relatively difficult to switch fully from type 1 fibers to type 2A fibers with training. There is an idea that you can see here on the slide, we have a transition between type 1 and type 2 with a question mark. Uh, there is some literature to, uh, to suggest that maybe this does happen, but we're not fully sure, right? So again, power training, resistance training, things that are gonna stress more the glycolytic, short, high intensity exercise. Those are gonna then push it more to the force and power generating uh, fiber types. Maybe not a full shift, as you can see though, we can get a little bit of that intermediate in that type 1C fiber, whereas it's relatively easier to shift from type 2X to type 2A. One point that I wanna make, because I think students are pretty interested in this, is, is how long does this take? In general, we don't have a great timeline, as far as research goes, of how long it takes to actually cause fiber type shifts to occur. I will note, however, though, that it's a long time, right? It takes lots and lots and lots of training in humans in order to get these fiber type shifts to um, occur. So just taking a naive human who's never really exercised before and doing a 16 week uh, exercise training session likely isn't going to cause a transition. This is something that comes from training years and years and years. And indeed we see this, that if we look at highly trained competitive athletes uh, in pro sports, then, the, then this is where we can really indicate that these kind of fiber type uh, different patterns take place, right? So our endurance runners are, are people who are um, competing in marathons, uh, um, in 10Ks, et cetera, et cetera, our long duration events, they are gonna be more type one fibers and then uh, in type 2A fibers, whereas our sprinters, our jumpers, uh, uh, maybe football players you could probably lump into that are gonna be more power athletes and they're going to have more type 2A fibers and potentially more type 2X fibers. However, as I mentioned, right, we don't transition ever really to type 2X fibers. Which brings up an interesting point. Uh, in a previous module, we talked about um, and showed a video from Dr. Trappy, who uh, showed some really interesting data on the world champion sprinter, Colin Jackson. So what he found is that skeletal muscle fiber type was an astonishing 25% type 2X fibers. So one, I'll note that that is incredibly high. So they're looking at the thigh muscle. So Normal humans, I think he mentioned, they typically see around two to 3%. You'll see some in the literature that says that it's up to maybe 8% type 2B or type 2X fibers in a human uh, in the thigh muscle, right? So we don't have a lot of 2X fibers just to kind of go around. Other muscles, that's not quite the case. We do have more, but talking the thigh here, which is what they measured in him. So he has an astonishing 25% type 2X. However, I just told you that we don't really transition into 2X fibers. So how did, how did he get so many, right? It's unlikely that he was, was transferring. So, so how is it possible for him to have such a high percentage of type 2X fibers where I just told you training tends to lead you to type 2A fibers? 
ultimately, there's two potential answers for this question. One is genetics. So the classic saying in sports is that if you want to be a pro athlete, you should pick your parents wisely. Of course, we don't have the ability to do that, but that's the idea is that you are genetically predisposed to having a certain amount of fiber types, right? So certain people, I'll use myself for example, I will never be a, spa a fastest sprinter as Usain Bolt. No matter how hard I tried, no matter how hard I trained, I don't have the genetic predisposition to have a high number of type 2X fibers, such as the sprinter in our example here, Colin Jackson, of having just a ton of type 2X fibers that then make me a powerful athlete and able to compete. Okay. Vice versa, we can go in the endurance training as well as certain people are genetically predisposed to have lots of type 2 fibers, which of course makes them great at endurance training. Okay. So as you can imagine, these people who are genetically predisposed, as they train and we can see fiber type transitions happen, they get even better at their sport, which is, of course, the case. So that's one possibility, is that Colin Jackson was not just born with 25% 2X, but maybe 50, 75% 2X, and as he's trained, it's come down to 25%. I will say I think this scenario is highly unlikely. I will also add the caveat that I can't rule it out. The science behind fiber types transition, especially in pro athletes, is incredibly difficult to study for several reasons. One, it's really hard to do longitudinal studies because we have no idea who at the age of 13 is ultimately gonna become a world champion sprinter at 25 and be able to do those studies, right? So getting pre and post, near impossible. Second, when we have world champion sprinters, they aren't really very willing to give up muscle tissue. So they don't wanna give up a muscle biopsy uh, at any point because they're afraid that that may hurt their performance. While the procedure completely safe, as Colin Jackson was able to undergo and had no, you know, of course, um, bad things happen, it is still one of those things that athletes say, yeah, I, I don't want to do that. I'm good. Um, and so it's incredibly difficult to, A, screen athletes and get longitudinal data, and two, it's incredibly difficult to actually get athletes to give us samples in order to be able to make these measures. So again, I can't say that this is the case for Colin Jackson, but I don't think that's the case. What I truly think is that his training is fully stressing glycolytic and staying away from any oxidative demanding, uh, uh, demanding conditions. And that's going to lead us to ultimately as we start to get into the next two sections of how we look at exercise. So one of the key things that I want you to continue to think about over the rest of the semester is the idea that exercise is a stress on the body. Right. So what happens is we, create, we do some type of exercise. That exercise is difficult, as you guys are likely aware of. Most people who are exercising hard uh, to get adaptations, who are training, aren't having a lot of fun. Maybe there is some fun involved, of course, or some, uh, you know, get, uh, get enjoyment out of the process, et cetera, et cetera. But in the, in the heat of the moment, hard exercise is indeed hard. Right. So, it is difficult on the body, and the way the body then thinks about it is it responds to that stress in an appropriate manner. The idea for the body is that it says, oh, you put this stress on me, so when that happens again, I'm going to be ready for it, and I will be able to then handle that stress that you then put on me. Right? And so when you stress it, the body then responds, and you're now equal so that We've all, we've all seen or, or kind of get this idea in strength training is the idea that you kind of uh, progress weights over time, right? So you're able to lift something as you kind of start to, um, in order to continue to grow, you have to continually increase the amount of weight you do. In other words, you adapt to that stress, you need to add more stress, aka adding more weight, and then you work out with that, you adapt to those stresses, you then have to add more weight to stress it even further, et cetera, et cetera, and that's essentially how training works. So in this situation, I think Colin Jackson probably has a, um, a workout that is so tailored to what he does as a sprinter, the 100 meter sprinter or 110 uh, sprinter, uh, so he is really focused on exercises that aren't going to stress his oxidative metabolism systems at all. Remember those systems that are highly prominent in type 1 
and pretty prominent in type 2A. So if he doesn't stress them, there's no response from the body to try to A, adapt those fibers or convert those 2X fibers to 2A. Truly a specificity of training in order to keep him in that way. So that's going to end this video. We're then going to jump into endurance training next uh, and then follow it up with uh, strength training.